No, he, um, David says something is not quite working. So I'm like literally three days ahead of myself and that's it. <laughs> three days? Yeah, you like, I like to be several weeks ahead of like oh. where I need to be, but I'm about one to three days right now in terms of staying ahead of curveball. What about you? Good morning, everyone, and welcome. No, no, I mean, it's, it's first things first. This was left by the coffee machine. I don't know if it belongs to anyone. Nope. We're going to leave it right up here. If someone finds it. I am Felicia Jacques, board president of CHAPA and EVP of development at Maloney Properties, Inc. On behalf of CHAPA and our co-sponsors, the local initiative support group, LISC, Massachusetts Association of Community Development Corporations, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and New Ecology, Inc. It is my pleasure to welcome you to zoning in on decarbonization in the production and preservation of affordable housing, zero in. Thank you to our hosts, Nixon Peabody. And the Nixon Peabody team is always there to support CHAPA and, after this beautiful, and offer this beautiful space for us to convene on important topics like the one that we are here to discuss today. At CHAPA, we strive to keep the affordable housing community informed of policies, programs, and issues that impact the production and preservation of affordable homes and to provide information and tools needed to create, preserve, and plan for the homes that people, that our people, our communities, and the Commonwealth need to thrive. As the effects of climate change cause more and more harm, um, and people are experiencing an unprecedented need for affordable housing across the state, particularly in communities that have been disinvested in, there is no more immediate need than a forum that features <clears throat> esteemed public and private sector voices to address sustainable, affordable, and equitable housing production and preservation. The need for housing is clear. We need 200,000 new homes by 2030. However, just producing homes won't meet the wide range of needs that people have. We need to be intentional. As we grow our overall housing stock, affordability must be prioritized. This means putting policies and funding in place for 40,000 of these homes to be affordable for people with moderate incomes and 20,000 to be affordable for people with low and extremely low incomes. As we work to produce more of the homes that people need, we must also preserve our existing housing and plan for additional growth. Just as intentionally, policies and fundings are vital to meeting our wide range of housing needs. We must also be intentional about how we produce, preserve, and plan for the homes that people in our communities need for a thriving future. As we will hear from our keynote speaker, Chief Melissa Hoffer, we must develop green housing not at the expense of affordable and equitable housing, but as part of that goal. We will kick off today's discussions with an opening address by the first ever cabinet level chief in the country, climate chief in the country, Melissa Hoffer, who will discuss the Healy Driscoll administration's holistic approach to greening our economy. Chief Hoffer will then moderate our policy panel that will feature leaders from the Department of Energy Resources, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and Mass Housing to talk about policies and resources to support our affordable housing and climate goals. Our second policy, led by Andrew, Andrew DeFrancia, Executive Director of Harbor Lights Home, We'll moderate our implementation panel. Panelists will share guiding principles of environmental equity in the sharing of benefits with low and moderate income households as we transition to a clean energy future. This panel will cover practical and essential tips in the planning process that will minimize the likelihood of cost surprises. Our goal is for the audience to leave this forum today with an understanding of the why we must work and the how we can do it. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I will mention a few housekeeping items. We're planning to record this session, which we'll, we will then make available as a resource for green homes development. Our panels will each run about 50 minutes, including a Q&A at the end of each panel. We aim to wrap up at 11.30. However, please feel free to mingle with speakers and other attendees until noon. 
Melissa Hoffert is Massachusetts' first ever climate chief. She joined the Biden administration as a day one political appointee, serving as the acting general counsel and principal deputy general counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to serving in the Biden administration, Chief Hoffer worked in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office as Chief of Environmental Protection Division beginning in 2012 and was named Chief of A.G. Healy's newly formed Energy and Environment Bureau in 2015. Chief Hoffer held senior roles at the Conservation Law Foundation and practiced for many years as a litigator and environmental lawyer at Wilmer Hale. We are honored to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Chief Hoffer. Thanks so much, Felicia, for those warm remarks and special thanks to Chapa for organizing this event. Can you all hear me okay? Great. You know, it's a very, very timely discussion for us. And it's also a very important discussion for us. I just kind of wanted to start out by emphasizing a point that Felicia made, which is, you know, we're at a time where we are in a housing crisis, and we recognize that our administration has been hyper focused on it. Um, I think folks probably know what well, we will not talk about it today, um, but we do have a housing bond bill in the works, and people understand that we need to both meet the goals for housing that's necessary and also ensure that as we are building new housing and going through housing production, we're doing that in a way that's not gonna undermine our climate goals. But, but there's more to it than that. We actually need the housing to help us further what we're doing on the clean energy front. Like right now, um, Mass Clean Energy Center has done a study back in the spring that identified the need for 30 to 40,000 new workers in the clean energy space. And these are folks all, all across the, the scale from, you know, folks coming in at, at a line level doing installation of PV on houses to folks that are going to be, you know, doing engineering for some of our wind farms or other needs. So we actually need that housing in order to be able to provide a place where workers can live and afford to be in Massachusetts. So I see these goals as really interrelated, not just because, you know, of the policy concern, but practically we really do need the new housing so that we can have that available for folks who are gonna be here to continue to build our clean energy economy. So with that, I wanted to kind of frame today a little bit the um, context for this discussion. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about some numbers in, in the climate space and how housing relates to our climate goals. I'm gonna talk very very briefly about the legal framework um, that governs our emission reduction mandates here. And then I wanna to talk to you just a little bit about my office. So <clears throat> let's start with the with building sector itself. So in Massachusetts, the building sector, so that's, you know, we can just look out the window and see all of it. It's over half of the energy that we consume. So it's a huge, huge number, it's 54%. That's all the energy that we consume. And by and large, it's all fossil fuels. So we burn a massive amount of fossil fuels for heating and cooling. And fossil fuels are what is fueling climate change. That's it. There's deforestation. It's a, it's a significantly less of a percentage. By and large, it's burning stuff like coal, oil, and gas. So when we talk about decarbonizing, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking the fossil fuels out of the system. And when we're talking about doing that in the housing space, that means removing delivered fuels like oil and propane, and it means getting off of piped gas, okay? So piped gas is something that we made a big investment in. States like Maine and Vermont didn't. So they can sort of leapfrog right to installation of heat pumps. We can't do that. We're in the process of trying to stop the new gas from being built. We really need to do that and at the same time, shift over to clean energy. And when we're talking about things like that, I wanna be sure to emphasize the fact that this does have to be an equitable transition. So we've got workers here that have been critical to our economy, who have helped install our current, which will soon be a legacy energy system. And there are opportunities to transition those workers to new jobs in a clean energy economy. So that's really important for us to think about too. Um, What's the cheapest source of energy? Anybody want to venture a guess? 
who said it? The woman over here, energy efficiency, right? So the most, the cheapest form of energy is still a megawatt, and that is avoided energy use. So that's why it's really important when we're thinking about our main tools, and I know that Commissioner Mahi is going to get to this today, we're thinking about our main tools to reduce dependence on fossil fuels, it's building smarter. It's building with a tight building envelope that makes sure that we're using less energy. So the more we reduce our demand for energy, the less energy that we need to use from any source. All energy has impacts, environmental impacts, wind, solar, those things have environmental impacts, whether it's somewhere in their manufacturing and supply chain, um, or whether it's in their construction or, or what have you. So having those passive house standards, making sure we're building our housing to a standard that requires the least amount of energy is super, super important. So the good news is that costs about the same to do for new construction. And the even better news is, is that over time, the owners of those units actually save money in the operation of those buildings. So you have reduced energy costs when you have a building that uses less energy. The other good news about switching to things like air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, are people generally familiar with ground source? So, you know, you go about six feet under the earth's surface and it's a more even temperature there around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. You can pipe liquid through that, that will carry what is essentially cooler liquid in the summertime so that it can offer some cooling or in the winter months, it's warmer. So geothermal is a really exciting opportunity for us. But the thing to think about with these technologies is they offer tremendous co-benefits that are quantifiable. And when I say quantifiable, I mean, there are folks around the country now down in Maryland who are looking at the health benefits of decarbonized housing. And we heard about this at an event that was organized by the New York Federal Reserve. I see Maggie Superchurch sitting over here today. And you know this is really very interesting. So these are folks who are going into existing housing units, affordable housing units, deletting them, tightening up the envelope, putting in air source heat pumps, making other improvements, and then monitoring the health benefits. And they are finding unsurprisingly things like reduced instances of asthma, reduced needs for asthma prescriptions, you know, fewer missed days of work where a parent has to stay home with a sick child, fewer hospitalizations, that stuff all adds up to dollars. And so in some cases, they've been able to obtain Medicaid waivers, the states, because they can show the benefit of this investment. So that's really important. And it's another source of money for us to have. Those types of housing improvements are critically important for climate resilience too, as we have all seen this summer, the very unfortunate and rapidly accelerating impacts of climate change around the world. We saw them here. We saw floods, $30 million in, in one supercell event in Andover. We saw farmers lose their crops, a um, thousand acres underwater out in Western Mass. Um, you know, we saw folks in Lemonster, you know, have their homes condemned the day after a flood because the foundation was literally washed out from, from under the housing. So that also happens with heat. There've been a lot of studies um, in Massachusetts and otherwise that show a strong correlation between areas that were formerly redlined and areas that are now urban heat islands. So this is a justice issue. And when we put things like heat pumps in, they offer both cooling and heating. So when we see these temperatures that are higher than the average, and if we have unabated emissions in Massachusetts, we're on track to have three months of temperatures over 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer months by the end of the century. So imagine that, you know, that, that's more like a, a climate that we might see in, in South Carolina. So that's what's coming here if we don't take care of this problem. And this is another way that we get a resilience benefit from these types of investments. Just a little bit about the legal framework. We don't just do this because it's a nice thing to do. We do it because we're actually mandated by the legislature to do it. So in 2008, we passed a Global Warming Solutions Act. That statute was one of a handful of similar statutes um, that passed around the country at that time. It was very, very innovative. It put in place declining emissions caps for all sectors. The main sectors, I'm just gonna say them, you probably know them, power sector, building sector, transportation, natural working lands. And when we talk about the latter, that's really for carbon drawdown. We wanna preserve things like our forests and our coastal saltwater marshes so that those things can actually draw carbon from the sky, the atmosphere and sequester it, okay? So those, that's where we're focusing on for emissions reductions across the board. 
Um, there was litigation over the Global Warming Solutions Act or two SJC cases on, of course, the SJC has said that the legislature really did mean what it said when it wrote that act. And yes, state of Massachusetts, you actually do have to go out and figure out a way to reduce these emissions and you gotta do it by the dates that we told you to do it. So we have a clean energy and climate plan for 2030 and 2040. We have a roadmap climate plan for 2050. 2050, the net zero is our goal. So that means we have to get to net zero. And what that means is we reduce, we reduce, we reduce. And then if there's some you know, small amount of emissions remaining, we have to ensure that we're actually taking actions to offset those emissions. And that might be things like preserving additional forest or coastal marshes or things of that nature. So that plan, and I won't go into the details of it because I think others will touch on it. That plan is like our Bible. So we follow it very, very closely. It tells us the actions that we have to take by date certain to reduce emissions. So when we're talking specifically about the building sector, This is a different page of handwritten notes. <laughs> we have to have 100,000 heat pumps installed. This is what our modeling says to meet our 202050 target. So we have under a third of that now. So just to give you a sense, you know, this administration is coming into a situation where we're a little behind the power curve, um, so to speak, and we have some catch up to do. So it's really important. And it isn't just like hitting a target, it's hitting a target for the safety of, of people. You know, right now we're in a situation where um, we are seeing some rapidly uh, approaching tipping points on climate. So I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. So that's the legal framework. The statute requires the production of the plan. The plan then requires specific actions. And then we have various agencies that oversee them. So why do we need a climate chief? And we have this great you know, legal framework. We've got all kinds of organizations in state government doing it. Why do we need this? Well. It's because traditionally climate has, has been under the purview of state and federal agencies that focus specifically on environment and energy. So at the federal level, that's typically FERC or EPA. At the state level, that's typically DPU and EEA and all of its um, uh, agencies that form EEA. It's a large umbrella and there's about, I don't know, 6,000 small agencies under it. So. The thing that's important to remember is that's just too much climate change for those agencies. Climate change cuts across everything that we do. So the Department of Transportation, the you know Homeland Security, the Pentagon has identified as a threat multiplier. They deal with this issue all the time. Um, HUD, you know, all the federal agencies touch on climate change in some regard. And it's the same. It's the same at the state level. So one of the first things that President Biden did when he came in was create the first Office of Domestic Climate Policy that was run by Gina McCarthy um, with David Hayes, who came in, was formerly number two at DOI under the Obama administration. And those folks started to really inject climate change into everything that the federal agencies were doing. So that is the model that we are importing here at the state level. And it's very important to do because these state agencies and the secretariats are expert on their own specific areas. You know, health and human services, you cannot beat Secretary Walsh, and she also happens to be pretty damn good on climate. Um, and all the other secretaries are very good at what they do, but they might not necessarily have a deep dive on climate or understand what the intersection is. So our job is to drive that, to inject climate into the DNA of all of these agencies and make sure that we are rowing together in the same direction, in the same boat all the time, and that we don't have an agency undertaking a policy direction or objective that's gonna undercut our climate goals. So it requires us all to work together and that's been the governor's instruction, figure it out and work together. We have these goals, they may appear diametrically opposed, figure out a way to make them not be diametrically opposed. So that's what our job is and we take that very, very seriously. I wanna give you one quick example of it and then I'll conclude here so we can get started on the really important remarks today. Um, we started at the end of June, we announced that we would be establishing a the Massachusetts Community Climate Bank, and that lives at Mass Housing. I want to give a shout out here to my colleague, Mark Atia, who was instrumental in making that happen and a terrific partner on it. And it was innovative because while it lives at Mass Housing, the mandate for this bank, and by the way, it's the first green bank in the country that has an exclusive focus on affordable housing decarbonization. 
And so that in itself is, is hugely important and a terrific model um, across the nation. But what we wanted to do is pick all of our quasi-governmental agencies that have relevant expertise in this area. So the Mass Clean Energy Center, Mass Development and Mass Housing, who you know, have been doing this stuff for 30 years and over a billion dollars worth of deals under their belt, pull them all together so that we can figure out how are we gonna advance this goal of decarbonizing affordable housing, use all that expertise, working with our Secretariat for Housing and Living Communities, you know, working with the Climate Office to kick it off, but you know, then it's gonna run on its own, um, working with EEA to make sure that we have the benefit of their expertise. So that is truly um, an example of a cross-government approach where we are bringing together and leveraging all the expertise that we have to produce something that is novel and innovative and we believe positions us extraordinarily well to be able to capture federal funding. So what does this bank do? <clears throat> this bank was seeded with $50 million. Today, in fact, October 12th, we are in the process of pressing, pressing the button on submitting our letters of support for the various um, primary applicants for this greenhouse gas reduction fund money, which is about in total $20 billion, about $7 billion on top of that for solar. And we hope to attract co-investment that will allow us to begin to take steps to decarbonize you know, a pipeline of projects that we have in the works here. It will also allow us to, to leverage private sector investment. Private sector, as folks in this room know, is somewhat reluctant to come into the space of retrofitting existing affordable housing. There are, there are perceived risks around creditworthiness and, and otherwise. A climate bank can do things like provide a loan loss reserve. You know, we can say to a bank, okay, you you have some concerns about repayment. We can de-risk this transition. We're gonna transaction, we will make you whole if there is an issue with it. We can do things like interest rate buy-downs. So that's the kind of stuff that we can do to help, you know, spark the work that we need to accomplish in this particular sector. So that gives you a concrete example of some of the stuff that we're doing. And I think the last thing I just wanted to, to cover is um, the immediacy and the urgency of this issue. There was just a study that was done, I wanted to mention it to you, that came out this week, and it estimates that the cost to society of climate-driven extreme weather events, which is again caused primarily by burning fossil fuels, is $16 million per hour for every hour for the last 20 years. That's a number that doesn't take into account crop yield declines, it doesn't take into account sea level rise. The scientists acknowledge that the data that they relied on from low income countries <clears throat> was, was probably missing information. And so if anything, these are underestimates of the total cost. Two thirds of it comes from human lives lost. The lost productivity associated when people die because of climate events. One third of it comes from lost property and other assets. So this is a number that's just going to continue to go up. It doesn't include stuff like biodiversity loss or loss of the things that we need to live, like clean air, clean water, healthy soils, other ecosystem services. So this is a number that's just going to continue to go up. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about September. So September just passed. September was 1.8 degrees on average above pre-industrial levels. That's about that's a Celsius number. So that's about three, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. Pre-industrial levels are the time before we started burning gigantic amounts of fossil fuels. So that's a crazy number. And there's a climate scientist, you guys might follow him on Twitter, I do, it's Zeke Hausfather, he's out at Berkeley. And he described it to the press as absolutely gobsmackingly bananas. Now that doesn't really sound like the kind of language a climate scientist would use. But what you can see is the rising panic in the people who study these numbers. These temperature anomalies that we have just witnessed over these past since May are insane. So if you track these numbers, you know that. If you look at these graphs, you can see it. So why, why am I lingering on this point? Because we don't have a choice. So we're talking here today about investments. We're talking here today about the need to move this forward. But as a, as a longtime environmental lawyer, I always think about NEPA. And for folks who know NEPA and MEPA, you'll, you'll get this. But you always have to do a no action alternative. 
That's like, what's the environmental impacts if you don't do the thing that you wanna do, okay? So here, our baseline is shifting. It's not a choice between what is out there now and then a, a clean energy economy that's more equitable. It's the choice between an increasingly degraded, destabilized environment where we will see increased political instability and we will see increased instability of our global financial markets. That's what we're looking at and that will happen in our lifetimes. So this is why it's so important for us to work through these issues today. And I'm very happy to move on to introduce the rest of our panel. My longtime colleague and good friend, Commissioner Elizabeth Mahoney of the Department of Energy Resources, Mark Atia, who is Director of Capital Formation at Mass Housing, Amy Steitling, who is Chief of Programs and Climate Officer of the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. We also have, I'm going to do my best, uh, although it's a tall order, to channel Under Secretary of Environmental Justice Maria Belen Power. Um, when we're done our other remarks, she couldn't be with us today, but she has sent us some beautiful remarks and I will read those at the end of, of the other panelists' comments and then we'll have time for a question or two. Thank you. Not, I'm not checking for texts, I just talk a lot. So I need to time myself. <laughs> Uh, I'm a middle child, so this is what happens. Nobody listened to me for my whole life. Um, okay, so um, thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am, as the chief said, I'm Elizabeth Mahoney. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Energy Resources, and I'm so grateful and excited to be here with all of you today. And uh, thank you to Chapa uh, for inviting me, um, um, to Felicia and, and Carol, and um, and um, my old colleague from the Senate, Rachel Heller, who I know is not here, but um, it's great to to be working with her again. Um, you know, the the chief just covered the why, uh, why we're here. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the how. Uh, at DOER, you probably know we do a lot on encouraging adoption of electric vehicles, uh, incentivizing solar, building out offshore wind, talk about challenges, um, and uh, many other uh, power sector focused um, needs. But we also are charged with working on energy efficiency and uh, the stretch code and, and the building energy code. So we spend a lot of our time talking about what the chief said of, of attacking the most cost-effective uh, energy, and that's energy efficiency. Um, we know that to meet our climate goals, we're going to have to work on millions of existing buildings that need uh, uh, retrofits. And we also are very aware that the cost of electricity right now is significantly higher than the cost of natural gas service. I say right now because in the future it's going to be different. But um, while converting, um, we know that converting also propane and and heating oil or or he to heat pumps pays for itself even before the benefits of air conditioning are included. So we're really thinking through electricity versus gas versus delivered fuels. But we know that the combination of energy efficiency to reduce heating and cooling loads along with heat pumps which are three to five times more efficient than fossil fuel boilers and furnaces they replace, is critical to reducing bills while removing the dependence on fossil fuels. And the good news is that given the governor's priorities and the unprecedented access to federal funds and tax credits, we believe that affordable housing owners and residents can lead the decarbonization charge and reap the benefits. Earlier this year, um, we did announce a, a grant program that I'll, I'll talk about later, and it's focused on what this administration is focused on. The hallmark of this administration is focused on equity, improving and ex expanding access to affordable housing stock and prioritizing disadvantaged communities through housing planning. Um, you know, I think we all know that one of the big challenges is the building code and uh, coming up to speed on what we've put out there and what is now expected. Um, we have over 300 communities that have adopted the, the stretch code and now up to 20 communities that have adopted the special specialized stretch code. 
Um, we believe in those codes because new construction and renovations can't set us back further. We need to attack those and, and start working on them. Ensuring that new construction is 2050 compliant will result in immediate cost-effective greenhouse gas emissions reductions and reduce the need for expensive building retrofits in the future. The updated stretch code and the municipal opt-in code set high efficiency be benchmarks for new construction. And these investments will result in reduced energy footprints for both heating and cooling, saving utility costs and reducing GHG. We didn't approach these codes lightly. Um, the, the legislature asked us to step up and do it, but we took our time. We did a lot of analysis uh, and we th that analysis does support, we believe, the, the work that we've set into place. Our approach is to optimize costs, invest in building envelopes and ventilation, downsize heating and cooling systems to offset these costs and achieve significant cost-effective emissions reductions. So. Um, somebody on my team calls that the trifecta. Um, in many cases, the cost to build with heat pumps is lower due to the shift from a gas furnace and central AC to more efficient and less expensive heating equipment. And add to that the significant incentives available through MassSave for highly efficient all electric construction. I'll also note that MassSave uh, in partnership with the Passive House, nope, I skipped a page. Apologies. Uh, the reality, uh, the reality of extreme heat we face due to climate change, even here in Massachusetts, demands uh, that AC cooling is needed. The chief talked about it. Um, it's just a reality. I, I was never one to have AC. Now I am. Maybe it's my age, but can't live without it. Um, the specialized uh, opt-in code is an ambitious, higher-tier code available to municipalities. Uh, to opt into. And, and we know that's a big step for municipalities, uh, builders and residents to take. And as I noted, 20 communities have now taken that step. Part of that specialized stretch code is a phased in passive house strategy for multifamily buildings over 12,000 square feet. I have a feeling that's what you all are working on. Passive house is the accepted cost optimized approach for reducing emissions from multifamily buildings. It requires investment in envelope, reducing air infiltration and optimizing ventilation. But much of the increased investments is offset by reduced and simpl simplified heating systems. In Mass Massachusetts, passive house planning has increased from under 50 units in 2018 to nearly 14,000 units currently pursuing passive house certification using mass save incentives. Um, we have seven fully certified passive houses now, 15 to 20 are very close to co completion, and we have a total of 198 total units working their way through Mass Save. That's, that's where we get the 14,000 residential units from. So a big difference from where we just had one uh, in just a few short years. And I, I know that a lot of you um, understand why we need to take these steps, um, but maybe wondering, how do you close the pricing gap? Uh, MassSave provides significant incentives uh, for engineering, feasibility, construction, workforce development, trainings and cert certifications. We believe that these incentives help builders and developers comply with the new code, and we estimate $600 million in MassSave dollars will help new construction over the next decade. Federal tax credits, of course, are plentiful right now, uh, so go after them. $1,000 to $5,000 per unit are available. And DOER's own analysis shows that the combination of these rebates and tax credits for different building sizes cover incremental costs for all electric residential buildings. But before you get to paying for that, I'm sure you have to think about how do we plan for it? How do we design for it? Uh, this summer, DOER uh, was awarded money from the DOE to help with uh, training architects, designers, code officials. We're rolling that program out, and we know that that will be hopefully key information for all of you to help you achieve your goals. And um, we're also putting in our own, our own money at DOER. In addition to MassSave, we've got this um, grant program. We have money dedicated to the Merrimack Valley following the explosions there. And just yesterday, 
My team's hit, submitted uh, our solar for all application, $250 million that hopefully will be dedicated to all of your uh, buildings. Um, we're gonna pair um, solar with uh, the, all this e efficiency need, all of those barriers. We think it's a really great uh, key to unlocking a lot of these questions. So um, part of our solar for all application process was our stakeholdering. And that's, we really believe at DOER that talking to a lot of people um, helps us uh, make for a better uh, application. And we will continue uh, to do that sort of work with all of you. Um, and you, this is what happens when I plan on the train. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, I'll just I'll just talk about I'm almost out of time. Um, our LMI application, I think some of you may have applied for it in this room. Don't ask me if you're getting it. I'm not going to tell you. Um, but we had a grant program put out uh, in February, a really exciting program just for affordable housing units uh, to get money from us to help with some of that barrier mitigation, to help with um, connecting solar or geothermal to the efforts that you're doing. It's been wildly successful and we're really excited about it. You all are very much looking uh, to work with us and to uh, get extra fun funding for all of this extra work that we're doing. Uh, and so we hope to have an announcement soon and another gr grant application due December 1st. Uh, we're also making sure we look at our own checkbook to see what other money we can put into that program in the future. So don't give up. Uh, and we're trying to provide a lot of technical assistance to all of you to, to make that possible. Um, I talked about solar for all. I think that Mark is gonna talk about a lot of the federal funding, but I'll note that uh, DOER is also in charge of Homes and HERA funding, which we are going to, we haven't um, announced what exactly we're doing, but it will be focused on low and moderate income housing. There will be a, a significant portion dedicated to affordable housing. So that will be more help coming your way. Um, and you know we continue to chase down every dollar that's, that's available uh, and, um, we think, you know, we like I said, we believe in the stretch code. Um, we think that's right for the exactly to to deliver on the why that the chief spoke about. We know that it comes with challenges, but we're ready to partner with all of you to make sure that implementing the stretch code and delivering on these results to your um, buildings and your residents uh, is the right thing to do. So thank you. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I do love seeing everybody in person. It is electrifying. <laughs> I'm glad that landed. I'll use this. Can you put it on uh, full screen? All right, so what are you done? So um, first, let me thank Melissa Hoffer, Climate Chief, Secretary Augustus, who I know can't be here today, my boss, Crystal Cornegay, uh, Jonathan Schrag, who I wish was here. And um, I just have to say, we are very fortunate to have you as partners, the whole field is, uh, and for giving priority to the intersection of affordable housing production and climate policy. As always, leadership and collaboration matter most when seeking to do big things, right? So I'm going to take us through five slides to help frame uh, how we arrived here today at this important meeting and preview the role of the Climate Bank and the resources to come in 2024. I hope this will help us begin to answer the burning question of how the hell are we going to do that? So here's the context. First, Massachusetts has set ambitious goals to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. This is what Chief Hopper was talking about. Now, the commitment has been backed up by action, certainly within the building sector. According to the 2050 decarbonization roadmap, for most of the last decade, Massachusetts ranked number one in the US for energy efficiency, according to various industry surveys. Now, this achievement is attributable in those reports um, in part to nation leading stretch, uh, nation leading energy codes and fuel switching trends over time. And in my view, uh, attributable to less visible program features like the tax credit qualified allocation plan that 
most people in this room have sitting by their bedside table. Second, still, buildings are the source of 27% of greenhouse gas emissions. About two thirds of this is associated with res the residential sector and mostly for domestic space heating uh, and water heating and the other nuances that uh, that are that uh, the climate chief enumerated. However, in cities where most environmental justice populations live, buildings can represent as much as 70% of total emissions. Third, enter the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Now the IRA is a vast spending bill, which has a strong and intentional, fo intentional focus on reducing emissions with provisions throughout the bill that target the housing sector and specifically targeted within disadvantaged communities is the term of art in that document and others. Next, enter the community climate bank. Envision as a dedicated financial facility and partner to accelerate decarbonization strategies. We'll do this by leveraging federal and state resources and leveraging Mass Housing's decades of experience providing financing solutions to build, preserve, and retrofit buildings, as well as provide mortgage options to single family homeowners. Experience that includes expertise in financing passive house deep energy retrofits, and other high efficiency building solutions. Now the Climate Bank's immediate focus is on affordable housing. This is wonderful to hear. Giving priority to a just energy transition and the needs of environmental justice populations where residents bear a disproportionate burden of energy costs and the brunt of the negative effects of climate change and most of the risks. Now to jumpstart this effort, we have been focused on positioning ourselves to attract federal funding into Massachusetts. Now the IRA directs about 400 billion in federal dollars towards reducing carbon emissions through a variety of tax incentives, loans, and grants. Over 40 billion is slated for housing and technical assistance with a focus on enabling projects in those disadvantaged communities. Now, this series of programs is really what I'm calling directed funding because they, there's some sort of administrative uh, procedural uh, requirement for us to design programs around these sources. There's a whole ocean of other tax credits that are more kind of point of sale. So for example, if you're buying an EV car, that's something that's, uh, you know, happens in the traction, transaction between you and the, and the seller. But these are programs that we're gonna be involved with, with running. So the largest is the EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. I'm gonna talk about that, 27 billion uh, that is intended to be leveraged with private investment in projects in a way that may in time serve as a recurring source of climate related lending. Now the EPA issued three NOFOs for 27 billion. These NOFOs are literally due today as the chief said, and so beers on me immediately following this seminar. <laughs> um, now the stated purpose of all three programs are, are these. One, to reduce emissions within priority areas. Two, to deliver benefits to low-income and disadvantaged communities. And three, to mobilize private capital to underinvested geographies. A very simplistic way to understand what these programs mean to us is this. NCIF, 14 billion will be granted to national consortiums who are competing for this pot of money who then must loan or invest those funds into qualified projects or otherwise provide financial assistance in a way that recycles that capital in some way. Now the Climate Bank will be a partner to one or more of these national consortiums and ultimately direct low cost sources into project like, projects like yours uh, in a, a variety of, 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 of method, methods and instruments we anticipate. CCIA, Six billion is more grant-like capitalization funding that is intended for smaller community lenders like CDFIs uh, and intended to allow organizations to fund their own programs. Sort of a complement to the NCIF program that is borrowed in effect or directed from national consortiums, 
the CCIA is the capitalized interest rate we will use to run our own programs, match funding, or otherwise use directionally consistent with many of these purposes. And solar for all, $7 billion awarded to a state entity, in our case, DOER, intended to expand solar programs for low-income communities. Now note, in pink there, the vast majority of this funding is being codified around projects that are in low-income and disadvantaged communities, their definition, which proxies gateway cities, environmental justice populations, low-income census tracts. This is a powerful mechanism for targeting. So come next summer, July, when the EPA begins releasing funds, that's up to them, can't be earlier. They said the first month of performance is July. I expect that through the Climate Bank, we'll be able to blend several of these sources into familiar capital stack structures that will work well with housing projects. And I assume predominantly for now, based off of a reading the landscape and ongoing involvement with the national consortiums, the housing family and generally the community development family uh, might expect that a common form of financial assistance is gonna be um, low income, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a low cost super subordinated debt to help facilitate the additionality, the incremental cost to achieve the higher standard in a way that but for otherwise would not exist without this money. So as you think about what we can do with this federal money, remember this as a starting point, taken verbatim from the EPA NOFOs that are current, currently a whole host of expert national consortiums are competing for and which programs will be designed around. Remember this as a starting point. There are the EPA will require that qualified projects must, uh, must address at least one of three priority areas. These are distributed energy generation and storage, net zero emissions buildings, and zero emissions transportation. Two takeaways. First, net zero emissions buildings are front and center and discussed specifically in the context of housing throughout the NOFO, which mirrors a lot of the language in the IRA. And second, each one of these priority categories encourages uses within a multifamily and affordable housing context. So how does that work? Let me give you my favorite example. EV charging stations, zero emissions transportation, a priority area of investment in low income dis uh, disadvantaged communities. Through investment in affordable housing, through collaboration or partnerships, we may be able to move the needle on EV adoption, specifically through investing in enabling infrastructure in affordable housing, mixed income, you know, and other community amenities, precisely because it, that is where it is scarce. So in this way, the EPA has married the purposes of affordable housing with the ability to address another slice of the pie, the transportation sector. This is very powerful, and I think a very compelling opportunity for us in the, in the field. So in many ways, all of this makes for a very seminal moment in the climate finance field. And in part, I think, has corollaries to where the affordable housing industry began in 1986 around the, the creation of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which back then, if many some remember, is sort of like the Wild West. There's a lot of open questions. We weren't sure how it was going to work. And today, here we stand, you know, complicated, but efficient family of integrated, relatively seamless partners plowing for building affordable housing. I hope in the years come, we're going to have a conversation and the climate finance infrastructure is going to become just as an indispensable, you know, part of our vocabulary, our toolkit for building uh, efficiently. And we'll look back at this period in time as saying that's really when we uh, when acceleration began. So we're going to stay with Gage Mass Housing, the Climate Bank. We're going to stay engaged with all of you uh, more deliberately over the next several months. Um, 
to ready ourselves to, to get to work, particularly with deployment of federal funds. And candidly, I hope you leave this meeting as excited as I am about 2024. Thank you. Good morning, friends. Thank you for gathering us together, Chapa, and to talk about how we will achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, just 18 years away. And thank you, Climate Chief Chief Hoffer. And there's so many firsts on this panel. The first Climate Chief, um, the first Undersecretary for Environmental Justice, who is not here today, but we are going to read from the first Climate Bank, Community Climate Bank, and the first Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities, which I am not, in case you did not notice, but I am representing uh, Secretary Ed Augustus. So there's a lot of firsts going on right here, and there's a lot of figuring it out. And so um, I'm, I'm here to talk about where we've come from, where we're going, and hopefully give you a little bit of a pep, pep talk that this is not doable if Marx was not enough. So um, thank you all housing warriors, building performance specialists, designers, smart growth planners, service providers, housing authorities for all you do every day to produce housing and preserve housing and preserve tenancies and housing stability. It is a daunting task to um, for you and for us at Housing and Livable Communities to think about how we're going to quickly and rapidly expand our portfolio by that 200,000 units, at the same time preserving our very old and needy public housing stock and respond to a humanitarian global crisis in our shelter system, um, undo the unjust practices of zoning that have led to um, serious disenfranchisement of black communities. <laughs> Recover from a pandemic where um, inflation is the highest rates in decades, your construction costs, your operating costs, your utility costs, and your rents are rising and your tenants cannot keep up. And of course you're going to do your part to make sure that the global average temperature does not rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050. It is a lot. <laughs> and you are doing a lot. And you've always done a lot. None of us got into this business because it was easy. So thank you. Um, but I'm here to say, when has that not been true in housing and community balance? When has it been easy? When have you been able to do it all? It's always been complex, as Mark has said, and I believe we're gonna do it. And there's some good news, there really is. First of all, Reese, I'm gonna say three things, I'm gonna say them and then I'm gonna go a little bit further. One, the resources are growing for this work. Two, we are getting organized and coordinated. And three, we haven't done nothing over the past decade, over the last 15 years. We actually have done some, maybe not enough, but we have done things. We have a platform and this is going to be an iterative process and we are gonna keep on growing and developing and learning along with the technology, along with the financing mechanisms. So yes, there's a pending housing bond bill in case you hadn't heard about that. I cannot talk about it because it is still, believe it or not, under development. Give it about 10 days and you will see that it is going to be bold. It is going to energize you. It is going to expand the pot of resources for housing. Housing production, housing preservation, and yes, housing decarbonization, all at the same time. Um, there are real challenges like on sort of not enough resource, conflicting priorities, but that's always been the case, right? So we will get through this. So resources coming, in addition to the federal ones, there's some state ones coming too, but you all know, you filed the housing bond bill, it takes more than a year to pass, and then it's got to reflect in the capital plan. So we've got, you know, we're, we're moving in the right direction, but it's going to take some time. Um, second of all, organized and coordinated. There wasn't a title of, um, climate chief at the former DHCD or the former executive office of housing and livable communities. That's something that came from this administration. Obviously we have our administration's climate chief, but all the secretariats have theirs too. And we are talking to each other and we're having interesting, sometimes heated conversations about how we're gonna move forward. And we are being pushed and we're trying to inject that climate in the DNA of our secretariat. 
And then finally, and last, I want to talk about what we've done, not to pat ourselves on the back and say that we're the best, although I've heard people say in Massachusetts, we are a decade ahead of other states, people who work in this sector. My friend Ed Connolly, New Ecology, who works all over the country, 10 years ahead of other states. Now, I'm not saying we're done, we need to rest on our laurels, but we've done a lot. And so I want you guys to feel like you should get some credit for that, okay? Um, so first of all, public housing, you guys may or may not know, I came from the public housing sector. We kind of launched our sustainability program in the state portfolio around the same time as the Global Warming Solutions Act, 2008, the time of ARA, and it has grown. We have done the energy efficiency. We have done the air source heat pumps. We have replaced our envelopes and we are going further. I mean, we, we are actually looking at our landscaping in terms of how we deal with floodplains and wet sites. Um, and we are even dipping our toes into the deep energy retrofit space, something that is kind of unheard of for such a under-resourced uh, portfolio, but we are doing that. Um, and, and we're continuing to build our momentum. Greg, our sustainability director, up until now, our only one person at HLC devoted strictly to climate and sustainability has been pushing us along. And you mentioned the qualified allocation plan, but you all sleep you know, next to read the 100 pages at night. You know, it changed recently over the past five years. And it was because of partnerships with BOER, with developers, um, with you, with our finance friends. It used to always, it had for a long time, 10 great sustainable principles that were encouraged, uh, believed upon, and they were all good things. Believe me, if you read those 10 principles, you're not gonna disagree with them but we actually added priority scoring inside the QAP um, that put up in front enterprise green community certification, green building certification, exemplary building energy performance, passive house, electrification, on-site clean energy, all the stuff. And then we actually put money in our capital plan, small amounts of money compared to what Mark was talking about towards in those investments. And then we are seeing the fruits of that labor now, and that's what the next panel's about. We created a small but mighty um, climate-ready housing program, um, which was ran with LIS and Mass Housing and Mass Partnership, where we are able to fund Treehouse, which you're gonna hear about, um, and some other projects. We funded our first passive house multifamily with HRI, you're gonna hear more about that, uh, Finch, all that is recent, past five years, past four years. And so we have examples, we have things we can point to and things to do. So it's really about acceleration at this point and getting those resources, taking advantage of the technology as it continues to evolve. And, and then a lot of technical assistance um, and a lot of forums like this where we um, connect, talk to each other, educate each other and understand that we have a lot of shared goals. The space is still evolving and we're actually in a pretty good space, even though it might feel like we're behind to tackle these challenges. So thank you. <laughs> I have to say, I'm just so incredibly proud to work with this team of people and just, it's just so awesome. So uh, with that, I will, I'm gonna read um, Maria Belen's comments for us this morning. She's the Undersecretary of Environmental Justice and Equity at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Good morning. I am sorry to be missing this gathering and this very important conversation. I'm grateful to Chief Hoffer for reading my remarks. My name is Maria Belen Power and I am the Undersecretary of Environmental Justice and Equity my job is to think about vulnerable populations every single day. Every policy and every program we develop and implement has consequences. There will always be a group who will reap the benefits and those who will carry the burden. My number one priority is to make sure the distribution of benefits and burdens is a more equitable one so that we are not intentionally or by design repeating the same mistakes from the past and exacerbating inequalities. There is good news and bad news. I'll tell you the bad news first, which is what my 10 year old always wants to hear first. The bad news is that these inequities we have are systemic. 
They are built into the DNA of our society and can't be changed by one person, one governor, or in one administration. It's the status quo. If we do nothing, we are continuing to perpetuate these inequities. The good news is that because these inequities were designed and implemented by us, by humans, we can undo them. We have the power, the tools, and the resources to undo these inequities, and we must undo them. As we dig deeper into the how we get there, how we build affordable housing that is climate ready, we must pause and remind ourselves of the why. Why are we addressing climate and affordable housing together? Frankly, we don't have a choice. If we are going to survive the next climate disaster, we can't forget the lessons COVID taught us. Before the pandemic hit, environmental justice communities were getting ready and still are for the next climate disaster. And while we never expected a pandemic to hit us, the very same results we projected became true. Low income communities, and communities of color across the country were hit first and worst and are still having the hardest time bouncing back. In my community of Chelsea, we had some of the highest rates of infection. 80% of our workforce were deemed essential workers. We did not have the luxury to isolate or to work from home. My neighbors were the essential workers the folks who were riding public transportation at the peak of the pandemic to get to and from work. The people of Chelsea, like so many other low-income communities across the Commonwealth, put their lives on the line in the name of their economy. One of the many data points and lessons learned from COVID was that overcrowded housing conditions were a contributing factor to high infection rates. That was certainly true in Chelsea. However, what is also true is that residents living in affordable housing units had significantly lower rates of infection. Housing is a social determinant of health. Housing conditions alone can define your health outcomes. The pandemic provided us with a painful example of what will happen during a climate disaster. The difference with the climate crisis is that the residents and communities who will be most impacted have contributed the least to carbon emissions. That is true in our Commonwealth and across the globe. And yet it is those very same communities, low-income people and people of color who are already bearing the brunt of extreme weather such as flooding, urban heat island, wildfires, hurricanes, and so much more. So going back to the why, why do we do this? Because it is our moral obligation. We know that when we protect the poor, and the most vulnerable, we will all thrive. Coming from Nicaragua, one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, I know this is not a question about money or numbers. This is a question about priorities. We live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and some of the most advanced institutions and technologies. With the Healy Driscoll administration, we have a deep commitment to addressing the root causes of the climate crisis and poverty. We have a climate bank, the first in the nation to be dedicated to affordable housing. We have the tools and we have the political will. Let's build the solutions from the ground up. Let's build the cohesive and seamless energy ecosystem we so desperately need with affordable housing at the center. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions and I'll begin by posing one to the panel. We spoke a lot today about our work together and the newness, as Amy said, of having a Office of Climate Innovation and Resilience, which places secretary at climate officers at each of the agencies um, to be primarily responsible for furthering their climate missions. Um, and we talked about our whole government approach so I'm, I'm hoping that each of you could maybe just experience, share with us your experience of working in this whole of government approach and what that's been like for you personally and professionally. Go first. I need to go before Amy goes because she crushes it every time. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I, I joined the administration back at the end of February, um, but I'm building, you know, I come into a team that has um, attempted to work across borders, so to speak, and work um, uh, throughout the government. Um, but until we had kind of that, that uh, directional purpose from the governor and from the chief and others to really come together on all of this, um, we were um, having conversations and making headway with staff, but you know it's hard to go up and down the chain to get approval without that top um, that top down approach. Uh, so I think that what we've experienced this year is building on the connections that we've had in the past, and and getting buy in from everyone that we're you know we're working together. And uh, I think that we've had some really great success. I think. Certainly the solar for all application is uh, really a hallmark of that um, that experience. We are partnered with Mass Housing. We're partnered with Boston Housing, which don't worry, they're gonna uh, work for all of you, not just Boston. Um, we're working with uh, the CEC. So it's just an example of how we can um, take our collective work and desire to advance this um, these uh, applications uh, in a way that serves the the whole community, and uh, you know, the the chief talks about a whole of government approach, and that's you know that's what I was just talking about. But I I often talk about the silos that we've been stuck in. Um, we at DOER have always thought about well, we you know we've got to get energy efficiency, do more energy efficiency. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and then the DPU, the Department of Public Utilities, will say, oh, whoa, whoa, we can't what can we charge the customers? You know, we've got, everyone stayed in their little silos. Um, and uh, it's frustrating because you can't stay in a silo and be successful. So um, I really appreciate that now we're starting to think uh, cross department about how we can achieve these things, cross secretariat um, and bring it all together. Because if you're stuck in your silo, we're gonna waste money, we're gonna waste time. Uh, and so this collaboration uh, that we've really embarked on uh, and amplified this year and really had these connected threads uh, through secretariats and departments, I think um, is is paying off and paying dividends and hopefully will help you all um, be more successful in the work that you do. So I would I would say that First and foremost, the learning and sharing that's happened in just a very short amount of time since we've been meeting as a group through these cross-sectoral partnerships, whether it's the Federal Funds Working Group or um, through the Climate Cabinet. Um, I feel like I've learned a new vocabulary as much as I am a Hauser and maybe I used to be an energy efficiency person, the space has evolved a lot and quickly. Um, we used to say green, we used to say sustainable, now we say decarbonization. Um, that, you know, I feel like I'm learning a lot about you know, electrification equals decarbonization with solar and, and we can share those lessons with everyone else and see what the long-term roadmap is and how we fit into it. So that's great. That's good for our entire agency, just not me personally and for us as an ecosystem. I would also say that um, before, if, if I were to say like, what are the top priorities in housing, climate would always be on the list, but it maybe wouldn't be at the top of the list, right? But this keeps us honest and brings it up to the top more often um, and, and, and forces conversations and energy um, and investment, quite honestly, um, and, and maybe policy change, not in terms of laws necessarily, but in terms of guidance and sort of funding about how we allocate our resources. And that's a good thing. So there you go. I think we have, maybe have time for one or two questions from, hey, Bob. Uh, Bob Van Peter, Corporation. Um, it's incredibly exciting how many resources there are. And it's also a little daunting figuring out um, what resources make most sense. And I'm wondering what the various state agencies are doing to try and kind of uh, help help us as nonprofit developers and uh, folks navigate this and put together the packages. So the question is from Bob Van Meter of LISC, and what are we doing as state government agencies to um, 
help make clear all of the resources that are available. So I, I can I can start a little bit, but my deputy Jonathan Schrag, who is not here today, um, this has been a priority for the governor, and that's why we have Quentin and Jonathan focused on this. But I can say, particularly for municipalities, I know that we are going to be putting together resources, especially on the tax credits, which are unlimited to help provide some, some coaching around, around the availability. It's tough to provide generic advice in that space because it does tend to be um, project specific, but I know we will be working on that. And then I'll turn it over to a Amy. Do you want to speak sure. to that? I think that's what we need to do is have a, a very easy to read uh, roadmap of how the resources layer and what's appropriate when. And I think that is something I'll be working on with my friends here and bringing that out to the development community and the housing community, um, as opposed to just the municipality community. But it, it's not done yet. Um, we're getting started, but very clear, understand the need. And, and I'll just um, add for Bob from Brookline, I think. Um, <laughs> I... Um, uh, we are working on, you know, last year there was a clean heat commission that um, recommended that we put together a decarbonization clearinghouse. Now, what that means um, is different to anybody. If you ask what is a decarbonization clearinghouse, everybody will give you a different answer based on. But it is part of this solution of trying to come put together a centralized location for residents and for, you know, everyone else to uh, have access a single place to really look at what is available out there. And I'll, I'll add that I think the benefit of us working together helps to put together those resources. And uh, you know, I think DOER, along with um, my housing colleagues uh, are working together to make sure that technical assistance is available. And when we look at this federal funding, every time we apply for federal funding, we include technical assistance in there. And when we briefed someone last week, about what we were putting in for technical assistance, they said, "Ooh, that's a lot of money," and we're like, "Well, yeah, it's needed." So yeah. um, we are we are trying to bring the resources to you. And I'll just add, you know, one of the visions for for the Climate Bank, as as a feature of the very familiar mass housing, uh, you know, toolkit, is to provide you know a common a common point of destination, in particularly for for federal funding, but. The, this the nature of this relationship that is that has been that has been formed in very concrete terms over the past just three months has led to other areas of collaboration between DOER and Mass Housing. And so, you know, we're a huge government. There's always there's always going to be room, you know, for agencies to you know to you know to participate. But I, I do think with with the the mandate coming from Chief Hopper and the governor with the mechanism to, to collaborate with the institutional entity of the climate bank to help direct federal funds. The vision is to create a lot of sense out of how these resources layer to achieve a pretty concrete goal of bending the curve towards decarbonization, right? And so that's where we're working to, but we're gonna need your help. It sounds like I have some catch up to do, so I'll, I'll find you afterwards. Um, <laughs> over here in the, in the white, the woman standing, So the, the question is, what are we doing to meet our state climate goals? And the sentiment is that we, we are woefully behind in meeting particularly the, the goals around electrification of transportation and building sectors. So I, I can start by, by taking a shot at that one. Um, and I appreciate the question. I share your anxiety about it. I think everybody up here does. Um, 
And it's not untrue that we are far off the target, particularly when it comes to building sector decarbonization. And I, I think I said that in my remarks. So what are we doing to address it? The most important thing that we're doing is what we talked about here. We do have some catch up to do and we're really very focused on it. When you think about the key barriers to decarbonizing housing, it's money. So that's why we spent the morning talking about money. It's workforce. And then it's also making sure that we have the power supply. So if you, if you think about, um, so for money, you can hear that everybody is highly focused on ensuring that we're grabbing every cent of federal funding that's available. We've started the community climate banks that we can also leverage some private sector investment in that space. Over time, I would anticipate that we will expand the jurisdiction of the climate bank so that it can also invest in other opportunities for decarbonization. So we have that happening. We also have a $50 million grant program that's separate and apart from that for affordable housing. Um, so, so all we can do now is try to work very hard to increase the funding that's available and partner with people like the folks in the room to make it happen. The second thing that's really important is thinking about the workers to do all the stuff. So, you know, and I alluded to that in my opening comments, that means we both have to make sure we're improving our opportunities for education. So we've seen Secretary Tutwiler open up a clean energy and innovation pathway that will specifically focus on opportunities in the clean energy space for students so that they are primed and understand their opportunities in that space. We're also working to increase opportunities for workers. And we kicked off our mass talent website just a few months ago that is you know, basically matchmaking for job seekers and folks who want to employ people in the clean energy space. We have just announced that we'll be having uh, Emily Reichert from Greentown Labs come in to run Mass CEC. She has incredible plans for workforce development and also for economic development in the space, which of course will grow jobs. So those are important changes that we're doing right now. The third key barrier is really thinking about ensuring that we have the power to power all these heat pumps and EVs. And if you were to look at a map of the congestion in the distribution system, that's like the poles and wires that you can see when you look at, I'm not talking about the big transmission system, there are problems there as well, but let's focus on this one. If you, if you had like an old school overhead and you overlaid the map of where we have the, the most grid congestion in our distribution grid, it does tend to align with where the locations of our, our neighborhoods are that we're, that have affordable housing where we wanna do some of this work. So that's really gonna require us to be working with utilities in partnership. I, I was just meeting with DPU about this yesterday so that, that we are thinking creatively together about how we ensure that once all those heat pumps are installed and we have EV chargers installed, we get this money or, or any portion of the 250 million that we have requested to make sure that affordable housing is EV ready, we have to make sure that we can also provide the power. So. I'm just gonna say this because I want everybody in here to hear it. That means building new things. It means building transformers. It means building, having new wires that are gonna transport the power. It means having new substations and it's gonna mean having some of that stuff in places where people don't want it. So that is why we are also doing, Secretary Tepper is heading a siting and permitting commission that's gonna be taking input so that we can come up with a rational way of siting the infrastructure that we need. So I would ask everybody in here who is concerned about meeting our targets, please make sure, please do not raise NIMBY objections to this stuff. It is vitally important. We're going to have to live with infrastructure in places where we don't like it. And that's really important for us all to understand. I think I might've used all of our time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chief Hopper, Commissioner Mahani, Mark Atia, Amy Stitely, and Undersecretary Power for an incredibly informative panel. We look forward to bringing all of you back in 2024 to share updates and information on new resources for sustainable housing production and preservation. Everyone, please join me for a final round of applause for our panelists. <clears throat> Switch off. Ready? Yeah. Now, I'd like to introduce my fellow Chapel board member, Andrew DeFonzia. 
Andrew DeFonzi is the Executive Director of Harbor Light Homes on the North Shore. Andrew will lead the next panel on the nuts and bolts of how affordable housing developers put sustainability into practice and how we do this work equitably. Please join me in welcoming Andrew DeFonzi to the podium. Okay, party people. So now we're going to talk about how this is actually uh, getting done. I'm just checking to see if everybody who was on the previous panel has left yet, but it looks like some of them are staying around um, to to listen to the to the next part. So that'll be fun. I see you over there. Um, so uh, we do have uh, a variety of things to share with you here. Um, we're we're tight on time, so we're going to roll right into it. Each of the panelists is going to give. A brief presentation. Uh, I believe the new ecology friends are going to do a joint presentation, um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I have a variety of uh, uh, difficult stories and tales about how this works on implementation uh, as we're going through this evolution, and so some of that might be useful and helpful, uh, and I'm sure many of you in the audience uh, have your own experiences for how this is going well or not as we evolve. Um, so really delighted, uh, an excellent panel here, a lot of wisdom and experience, um, and we're grateful for everyone who's here. Uh, but in, this, in the uh, spirit of time, I will encourage you to check their bios in the handouts, and we'll go ahead and skip that, and their brilliance will be obvious, especially Mary's, who's going first. Uh, so Mary, I'd love to have you come up and share your wisdom with us. Thank you very much. Well, um, I really want to say thanks to Chapa uh, for organizing this conversation and to appreciate all of you that are here to think together about all these things that we all deeply care about. Uh, before I start my comments, I just want to say something about citing <laughs> of, uh, of, of um, I mean, citing of substations or grid infrastructure. I I know everyone is going to participate in um, trying to make sure that we don't oppose uh, siting of uh, infrastructure. But I also want to, uh, to say, as you actually say yes to a substation, especially in environmental justice communities, also say yes to a community benefits agreement because that it's only fair that we benefit the communities that live so close to substations. Thank you. Now to affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> so affordable housing preservation and production, and then reducing greenhouse gas emissions in a manner that reduces energy burdens as well as builds wealth in environmental justice communities are all non-negotiable objectives. We cannot do one at the expense of the other. So policies such as the Green Communities Act have brought significant energy saving benefits to the Commonwealth as a whole. In fact, this was said in the earlier panel that Massachusetts has been fast uh, rated as the number one state for many years in energy efficiency. But at the same time, when Massachusetts has been first, there's been a lot of neighborhoods and cities in the Commonwealth, like Lowell, where I live, that have not benefited from these programs despite paying into them. One may ask, what is she talking about? I'm talking about equity. You know, I want us to talk about anytime we talk about affordable housing or climate action, we must center equity. Affordable housing properties, like the ones I manage, have benefited from the three-year plans through the lean program, which has grown and improved its strategy because of many of you in this room I know a lot of CDCs participated in the development of a multifamily energy efficiency roadmap. So thanks to you guys, uh, 
passive house incentives. Many of you have shown up at the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council every, uh, every planning season and advocated for passive house incentives to be increased. So your role is critical in making sure that we have all the numbers that were cited in the first panel of how many passive house units or projects have been done in Massachusetts. We, are, we advocated, or rather housing folks advocated, so it got done. So thank you so much for that. We need to tell ourselves some truths about decarbonization. Deca the bill to decarbonize in the entire nation is in the trillions, okay? It's in the trillions. And that means that while I am super grateful for the IRA and all these other resources, they are not enough. Therefore, how we allocate these dollars at this critical time is going to be very important. We need a lot of these funds directed towards affordable housing, both subsidized or public housing. And let's not forget naturally occurring affordable housing, which is where most households are housed. These, are housing, these types of housing do not have subsidies and they do not have a lot of reserves to take on any capital project. Therefore, we need to center them in our conversations for decarbonization by being deliberate about resources. Let's talk about energy burdens. When we're talking about decarbonization or electrification, we always cite the health benefits. And I agree, we need reduced asthma rates. But you know something? Any increases in my bill can also give me high blood pressure. So we have to be very balanced in how we, we what we quantify as health. Asthma is health, yes. High blood pressure from high bills is health. Now, energy burdens in the Boston metro, metro area are about the median low income energy burden is 10.1% in the Boston metropolitan area. The median energy burden in the whole country is 3.1%. And this is before electrification. 32% of black households and 30% of Hispanic households experience a high energy burden that's above 6%. Guys, don't, don't beat me up. I'm just giving you the front. <laughs> these, are, these are real facts. So this brings us to my next issue. So projects in my portfolios, are diverse. Some have utility allowances, some do not. Some, if there's any extra bill in the, if, if there's an increase in the utility, let's say you are paying $74 and now it's 120. For some projects, that amount of money actually goes to the tenant, total tenant payment. So it goes directly to the tenant. Well, someone can say, how about you make the landlord pay for the bill? Well, I have a project in Roxbury right now and um, it's all, I mean, someone gave me the financials. I'm an asset manager. This is what I do. I asked, why is the project at 17,000 units per, I mean, $17,000 per unit? And I was told it's because you're paying the all electric, uh, bill. I'm not saying this happens everywhere, but there are some projects like those that may show up in your portfolio. Now, for those who are on the development side, if you went to D&D &D, uh, with your performa and you say, hey guys, can you fund me at 17k per unit per year? Nobody will fund that. Anyway, Let's talk about electricity rates. So electricity rates are already high and create burdens for many families. 
if we have to do something about the grid, they we need to build new infrastructure, right? So two big categories, uh, the transition to a carbon-free economy will present specific new challenges and it's important to address them now. The two big categories are one, how much total money are we spending on the electric system as we electrify? Two, how are we distributing those costs to protect all rate payers, especially those most energy burdened while encouraging beneficial electrification? Number two demands that we need rate design changes and build protections for low income and moderate income households. So I've said too much about the problems what are the solutions? So as we figure out regulatory and legislative avenues uh, for rate reform, I suggest that the state of Massachusetts thinks about running an operating subsidy pilot that facilitates fuel switching from gas to electricity for affordable housing projects that are undergoing deep energy retrofits and are switching from gas. Uh, secondly, we should leverage decarbonize, decarbonization investments to support social equity by reducing the risk of displacement, energy poverty, as well as increasing the pool of affordable housing units if owners and tenants are not saddled with bills they cannot afford. And we can actually make the zero carbon renovation fund a reality. I know we are talking about the housing bond bill. We need that, but we also need a zero carbon renovation fund. Are there other states that have done this? Yes. New York has a green bank. It's true. It's not just for affordable housing, but they also have a community decarbonization fund. And I think it's $300 million and above. Um, and I will stop there for now. Thank you. Brilliant, as I said. Um, we're next going to hear from Sarah Barkin, who's going to talk, I think, a little bit about a project specifically, uh, the Finch, so you'll get some details as to how this works. And we appreciate everybody hanging in there on the schedule. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Chapa, for hosting, um, pulling together this great group of people. And I'm really proud to speak on behalf of HRI. Um, so let me show you the building that we're talking about, Finch. Um, give you a little history first. We're a community development corporation. We're based in Cambridge. We were founded in 1972 and began in the 1980s to take on affordable rental housing. Um, both existing and new construction. We own about 1,700 units, mostly in Cambridge, but also Somerville, Newton, Watertown, Lowell, and Worcester. Um, and I'm very happy to have a bunch of my team members here today. Put your hand up if you're part of the HRI team. I know our board president is here, and I believe that the project architect is here. Are you here, Michelle? No? Okay. Um, so just for a little quick background, um, we've always been a pioneer in green and sustainable construction starting in the 1980s, 1990s with Energy Star, Green Specs, low VOC materials and other measures. In the early 2000s, we started taking more significant steps to reduce the carbon output of our portfolio with water conservation, high efficiency boilers, improvements to our building envelope and solar arrays. By the time we started planning the Finch project almost a decade ago, we were ready to take those measures to the next level. We wanted to achieve as close to net, net zero as we could, um, integrate health and wellness goals for residents, and align with the city of Cambridge's carbon reduction goals. We'd already achieved LEED Platinum at our previous new construction, Putnam Green, and we planned a very high performance building um, at the site then known as 675 Concord Avenue or Concord Highlands. Um, but we didn't initially set out to make a passive house project. Um, so this is Finch. We're at 675 Concord Ave, just across from Fresh Pond. 
It's a great location. And this, this photo was taken from the pathway at Fresh Pond, so it gives you a sense that we're really on the edge of a beautiful natural area. Um, this is a 98 project, uh, 98 unit project, all affordable um, workforce and low income housing tax credit or six floors with podium parking on the first level. The building is not directly in the 100 year flood zone, but it's designed with no first floor units, significant common space on the top floor that would allow residents and staff to shelter in place in case of any kind of an emergency. Um, our architect, Icon, had worked on one non-affordable passive house project, but the approach was new to HRI and to our contractor, NEI. So what are the basic principles that made this property passive house? Continuous insulation, no thermal bridging, i.e. no breaks in the insulation, airtight construction, high performance doors and windows, triple glazed, of course, it is incredibly quiet in this building even though we're on a major thoroughfare and fresh air ventilation with heat recovery. We have all electric systems with the exception of gas for domestic hot water, which at the time was prohibitively expensive to go electric. And as I think you'll hear many people say, Passive House is at its core, a set of construction methods. Small details are crucial. As you can see from the slide, if there's one important message, I don't know if you can read that, the, the label that was placed for the contractors to see, don't pierce the air barrier. <laughs> We also had really important goals for health and wellness in this building. Improved air quality, a lobby design that encourages stair use, that's how we got a FitWell certification, and even an exterior walking path that contribute to quality of life. Our resident service coordinator regularly leaves walks across the street at Fresh Pond. So Finch was really the first all affordable project to use Passive House, and we had a lot to learn along the way. Our on-budget TDC, we won't talk about the off-budget. Our on-budget TDC, remember, this is Cambridge. <laughs> Just remember. Um, on-budget TDC was 29 million for 98 units. That included about $500,000 for extra costs associated with Passive House. We did get about $300,000 total um, between Mass Save, Passive House incentives as well for Mass CEC. Um, the sort of biggest driver of those additional costs, um, and I should say um, the building was completed in 2020, so got into construction in 2018, so think about these costs from that time period. Um, the biggest driver of the additional costs largely included upgraded doors and windows, additional ventilation, and various expenses associated with consultants and testing. Um, what have we learned? First of all, Details really matter in passive house design and construction. The whole team, the owner, the architect, the GC, the subs, the owner's rep, rep, everybody is responsible for the successful implementation of a passive house construction project. So just to give you an example, at Finch, um, our HVAC sub forgot to preset the limits on uh, the thermostats. What did that mean? We pay for all the utilities, tenants only pay individually for the plug load in their apartments. Um, folks moved in, uh, we opened in August, 2020. Um, so folks were moving in August, September. Um, now we're beginning to get into heating season and there weren't any preset limits on those thermostats. So people were going wild. It was very, very nice to be able to, to set your, your uh, unit temperature, however you might be comfortable. And, it's a really powerful reminder. Who, who is living in our buildings? People are living in our buildings and people have preferences about how they like to live. And who could have anticipated we would have opened this building during a time when people were home so much more than they normally are. Um, again, fall of 2020, lots of people staying inside all the time. So um, suffice it to say that some of those costs associated with heating were a little bit unanticipated. By the time we figured out what was going on and brought the sub back to set those limits, um, it's very hard to take something away from people who are accustomed to living a certain way. None of us would like that. So it has been a real process between us, our residents, our management company, to learn how to live with a little bit of a different system. And that takes time. Even if we had gotten it right from day one, it would still take time. Um, 
those uh, those thermostats are a little more complicated than what folks are used to. I'm sure if I were living with one in, in my home, I would take some time to get used to it. So it's a real process. And our management company um, has been our partner from day one, but they tell us it's more of an intensive process um, to just support residents there than it might be otherwise. Um, and maintenance calls for those systems can be a little more complicated. There are relatively few uh, vendors that know how to uh, fix and adapt the system. So lots to learn for all of us. Um, and I should say uh, as well, I mentioned uh, the additional costs that came with the project. Those were largely driven by the upgrades to the doors and windows, the additional ventilation and various expenses associated with consultants and testing. Um, couple other things to note. Um, on the, on the really positive side, technology keeps adapting and advancing. So we're designing our next passive house building right now, and we will be able to go all electric because it's now feasible from a cost perspective um, to include our domestic hot water in an electric system. So that's great. Um, when we look at our energy data, um, it's it goes down, it keeps going down. Um, we did a comparison. I asked my team when we were preparing for this to do a comparison for me with our um, sort of highest standard, but not passive house building, where we also pay for sort of a similar share um, as we do for our tenants, but it's got a gas fired heating system. Um, and in fact, those costs are lower. That's um, on average about 636 uh, per unit per month, um, where Finch is about a thousand per unit per month. And that's averaged over the, the, the 12 month period. Um, so, Remember, gas continues to be artificially underpriced. Um, electricity costs are coming down, but they're not where we want them to be yet. We do have a solar array, um, but that only covers about 60% of our electricity needs. So I think we have to remember, we would love to transform our operating costs overnight. We'll get there, but we're not there yet. Um, just a little more information on our utility costs. Um, the energy use intensity um, for the one year period from September 22 to August 23, 37.1 um, BTU. Um, that's a pretty good number. That's about half of what you might expect for a comparable building size that's not passive house. Um, I think what we're trying to stay focused on is that when we bring in these electric systems, if we tried to operate those systems in a non-passive house building, the electricity use would be absolutely prohibitive. So it's really passive house that's allowing us to electrify. And as we continue to learn how to implement better, as costs of electricity keep coming down, I think we're gonna see some really significant outcomes. Um, and finally, here's, here's the building that we're super proud of. Um, in closing, I'll just say we love this building. It's a real flagship in our portfolio. It performs well, it looks beautiful, and most importantly, it's home to 98 families and it provides ample space for resident services and community activities. And at its heart, that's that's really what, that's really how we fulfill our mission. Um, and if anyone wants to come see it, we're happy to take you on a tour. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Really good uh, information. And I think for all of us, that's the nexus we're particularly concerned about, the relationship between being able to succeed on the efficiency front, but still have it work on the operating front. And we're working through that now. I can tell you, I did have a conversation with uh, Ed, Ed Conley over at um, New Ecology at one point when I was losing my mind on a deal where I had very similar problems. And he uh, wisely said to me, sagely said to me, uh, well, oh, if your building's not passive house, you're gonna get killed on electricity costs. And I said, well, what, what, why didn't somebody say that three years ago? And, um, so uh, I echo uh, that point. If we're going to do this, uh, the envelope has to be uh, amazing. So Courtney, if you'd come up and give us some feedback, we would love to hear from you. And then we're going to do um, Frank and Ashley together after this and take. Oh, Courtney, Frank, I'm sorry. Two for. Hi, everyone. I'm Courtney Coslow, Senior Development Director at Beacon Communities. Uh, great seeing everyone today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Frank Stone and I, alumni of New Ecology, who worked on the uh, this development, pre-development process with me. Well, we're going to be talking about a retrofit 
approach that we took for an iterative and replicable design. I think this is something that, as we talk about technical assistance, um, this type of process is something that we hope others can learn from and, and hopefully okay. adapt. Um, so let me tell you about our, uh, this is a, a retrofit of an existing development. So um, Treehouse at East Hampton Meadow is in Western Massachusetts. It's this wonderful intentional community that Beacon um, developed in 2006 in, in conjunction with the Treehouse Foundation. So it pairs uh, families who've adopted kids out of the foster care system with um, seniors who agree to be trained to mentor those, um, those kids. And it's this wonderful program. The Treehouse Foundation has their um, headquarters at the community building. So they're always there doing wonderful programming. Um, there are 60 units spread across um, many acres here uh, in 25 buildings or one and two stories. Um, so more similar to a single family context in many ways. Um, there are 48 senior one bedrooms and 12 family townhouses that are three, four and five bedrooms. Uh, 55 units are affordable, five are market. Um, so this was the right time to resyndicate and decarbonize. We had, we're past our year 15 and a low income housing tax credit that's a, a appropriate time to be thinking about refinancing. We also were having a problem with our operating expenses of a project um, of this size. It's hard to make the numbers work, especially across so many buildings. Um, so we really needed to be able to pay off our, our loan and, and not have debt going forward to make this a financially viable development. We also had relatively low capital needs given how long ago it was built. And as a, a company, we um, are dedicated to, to doing um, the best by our properties and, and being a part of the climate solution. Um, so as we were also seeing the, co the Commonwealth policy goals and funding sources were incentivizing that, this seemed like a great opportunity to do this pilot here. Um, it is gas fired individual heat and hot water systems at every unit. And the residents talked about cold um, drafty homes and in the townhouses especially, it was one um, zone and the second floor was really hot in the summer and, and cold in the winter. Um, so the process we used, uh, Frank is going to kind of delve into it, but we had a three-part design process. The first setting goals, which I'll go into in a moment, um, was really critical for setting the vision and making sure we were driving towards the goal. Um, we then learned what our baseline is through energy audits and lower door tests and prototypes and had a really wonderful iterative decision-making process. Uh, Keith Construction built this in 2006, and they came back to do this with us, which is really great. They know um, what, what this building is, and they have experience doing retrofits. Um, so decarbonization and electrification um, was top priority. I say decarbonization and not deep energy retrofit because you know, I, actually my little sub line on the front was how low do you go? I really think this is more of a moderate income, um, sorry, moderate um, energy retrofit, but we do, as you'll see, get to 50% energy reduction. So we're, we're getting to a great outcome. So I think it's a topic that we should be discussing. Um, so 50% was, was our goal and energy reduction. I really wanted to prioritize reusing and saving the materials. I don't want to throw away all the it's vinyl siding, which I don't love, but I don't want to throw that away in the landfill. That impacts the climate global warming today. We can't be doing that. So um, you'll see we'll be reusing at least 50% more if, if we're able to of the siding and also looking at the materials, trying to stay away from foam given um, the, the impacts that that have. Water conservation is obviously a key, easy um, thing to do. And um, we needed to do this without relocating residents. It would just have been too hard. And we had a, a goal of keeping our hard costs below 230. Maybe originally it was below 200, and then it kind of crept up as we did include some capital needs and are required to do ADA upgrades because of the level of renovation that we're doing here. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Frank Stone, who will talk about the, the design process. Um, and I do want to note, this is in pre-development. Um, we'll talk about the funding source, but we're, we're looking to start uh, the rehab a year from now if we're awarded funds. Thank you very much, Courtney. Um, so it's great to be here sharing with you all. Uh, so you see here the treehouse development. Um, and basically, we approached this project thinking about what Courtney identified, which is carbon both operating and embodied uh, and cost, first cost and also operating cost. So what we did uh, to begin with was to identify the buildings we had whole building data for, one of each type, uh, building three and building six are each a different and distinct and representative typology. Uh, we did full building blower door tests of each one. So that gave us our baseline uh, and, and formed the basis of what we were dealing with. 
Here's an example of building number six. So this is one of the buildings we used as a prototype. Uh, it was great fun to go on site and talk to the residents as we did the testing and hear what their expectations for the projects were. Uh, this is a three unit side-by-side -side, single story elderly housing building. Uh, and I'll note for the folks that the envelope is, is somewhat complex and also all of that attic space was unconditioned. So there's duct work and there's pipes running up in that space. And one of the main goals was to bring that space into the conditioned envelope. So what were the existing conditions? Uh, we took some thermal imaging, uh, therm thermal image camera images of some of the existing conditions. And what you see here uh, are the existing double pane windows. So they're good quality windows, but they're scheduled to be updated with triple pane. Uh, and also you'll see an attic hatch to that unconditioned space. So that's spilling some cold air down into the unit and resident comfort was a concern uh, that folks wanted to see addressed. So how did we do this? Uh, how did we work through this iterative process? So as Courtney said, we first did blower door testing with the utility data to understand where we were. Uh, second, as a team, we discussed briefly electrifying the systems only, uh, basically leaving the envelope as is. Uh, and we quickly decided that that was not a way forward. So third, uh, what the team did was to look at two major retrofit packages, one with a low upfront cost and one with a somewhat higher upfront cost and to try to understand where we wanted to land on that. So the five items that, that were identified here are things that the folks were thinking about. And we somewhat mixed and matched those uh, as we came to an understanding of where we wanted to be um, to, to come up with a final understanding uh, with the pricing data from Keith Construction, which was very important to the process to understand really what we could do and, and meet that cost goal that Courtney outlined at the beginning. So what did that design scope end up looking like? Uh, a brief summary of that is the exterior envelope uh, is upfit with uh, exterior continuous insulation. Uh, air sealing is done to bring the air change rate down to about two air changes per hour. Uh, heating and cooling is all electric. Uh, energy recovery ventilation is gonna be added. Uh, like Courtney said, uh, materials will be reused where possible. Uh, so to, to a great extent, we think that's possible with things like the siding. And then the team had to give away some of the items that had low cost to benefit ratio, like some of the foundation insulation. It would have required extensive site work to get that done. How did we work through these retrofit options? Uh, this is a somewhat busy uh, sheet that we looked at uh, as part of our process. But in the box are some of the items describing the upgrades uh, to the systems looking at emissions reduction of each systems as modeled out, thinking about the annual cost savings or the additional cost of running that system. And then very importantly, Keith Construction provided those upfront costs and the variance between the two, uh, two systems where there was a, a selection to be made. Uh, so that was super useful. So what we did was we understood uh, a number of items to be uh, included in the baseline package. These would definitely be done. And then there were a number of systems. So here it's seven through 16 where there were system choices. And these, these are where we did two energy models and then mixed and matched for our final energy model. So where did we end up? Uh, we ended up, if I can direct your eye to the top and the bottom line, basically thinking about a number of categories, um, annual water savings, including domestic hot water uh, to cut energy use. Uh, the annual electric savings uh, is negative because all systems again will be electrified. So gas is totally eliminated. So when you go to the natural gas column, you can see that all of that gas usage will be wiped out, which is, I think, a great achievement. The uh, modeled energy savings are 50% energy savings and 33% uh, operating carbon reduction. Very briefly, here are some details of the wall assemblies. Uh, so these wall assemblies, we've gone through a number of different ideas on what the material will be. We're hoping it'll be a wood fiber insulation with embodied carbon in mind. And then on the right-hand side, you can see where we're expecting to bring the attic space into the conditioned envelope uh, to solve a number of comfort and other issues. So Courtney spoke earlier uh, about materials. Uh, we were in a kind of constant process to reevaluate what could be done here. So we started off with her great idea to reuse the siding. And I believe that's an expectation of the project uh, in the spec now. Rocky Mountain Institute came along and really opened our eyes to a number of ways to uh, swap out materials, including some of the Timber HP products that the project is hoping to use uh, to sequester carbon. And as the market has moved forward, I, I understand the team is now discussing using the Opal window system, which may be something to reduce the effort and simplify the process, both for this project uh, and for future projects. So where did we end up? Uh, before uh, we were uh, using about 71,000 uh, BTUs per square foot. We've achieved an energy reduction of about 50% by tightening up the envelope, adding insulation, changing all the systems to electric, 
adding energy recovery ventilation and also uh, adding solar where it was feasible, which is uh, here on the community building. What did we achieve in terms of decarbonization? Uh, so this is a great uh, diagram done by Eduardo Ramos, and it shows three things. It's expressing uh, the, the emissions per square foot over time out through 2050. So the top line, the red line, is showing what would happen if the uh, project were left as is. If these 60 units were left as is, these are the emissions over time. As the grid cleans up, that line trends somewhat uh, downwards. The blue bar graph is showing what would happen after the retrofit. So you see the emissions jumping down significantly. Uh, and just for comparison's sake, even though the project is not subject to it, uh, we took a look at how this would compare to the Birdo 2.0 uh, carbon emissions standards. And that's the green line you see here. So this project would be in compliance with that expectation out through 2040 with these updates. Uh, so those were a number of things we thought about and iterated on. Uh, and I've been happy to share it to you and uh, share it with you. And I'll pass it back over to Courtney. Uh, so on the funding side, we have we're able to stay under that two hundred and thirty thousand dollars a unit in hard costs. That is, um, we'll be applying in winter round for various um, HLC funding sources like tax credits, uh, federal and state, and other soft funds. Um, we've applied for DOER's low and moderate income housing decarbonization grant program, which is an would be an enormous um, addition here at fifty thousand a unit. And we were selected in the first round of HLC MHP and List Climate Ready Housing Program which provided, uh, provides 750,000 uh, towards the work um, and the mass save lean electrification will provide another 10,000 or 11,000 per unit. Um, so finally, um, some questions and trade-offs as I, I posed earlier, how low do we go here? 50% is great, two air changes. We started at five air changes per hour, as Frank mentioned. We expect to be able to get to two air changes. Passive house is under one typically. We could go further. We could do foundation insulation. Um, if we did that, it would be destructive and, and disruptive. We'll have to take all of the flooring out. It's slab on grade. It will destroy the plants that are already there as we work through this um, and didn't have much, you know, we thought the 50% was good, so we stopped there. But um, I think it's for the policymakers and funders to help guide how, how much of your money do you want us to go? Do you want our project to go really, really far and do less of them? or do you want more people to go a little bit lower? So I think that's a really important question. And one thing that was really interesting here is technology changes. This is individual systems, as I mentioned. So for domestic hot water, I was convinced we were wanting to do air source heat pumps here. Um, and our, we, we put in the idea of electric resistance, which is not an efficient hot water system. But these are individuals uh, different on a multifamily large scale system, which is gonna last a really long time. Um, and serve a lot of units as, at once. Here, a electric resistance hot water tank is $600 a unit. It'll last seven to 10 years. An air source heat pump version, seven to 10 years is $5,000 or $6,000 today. We couldn't afford that. I mean, unless somebody wants to tell us we're going to put more money in the replacement reserve to do that, we, we would. Um, but now we chose electric resistance and modeling this out as our packages, you know, we switch perhaps to triple pane windows. We are, we do have triple pane windows, but we, you know, as it's all a system, we increased that, that, you know, the, the cost of that kind of was worth it compared with that. So that was one interesting thing that I thought. Um, and then this, this materials question and embodied carbon impacts, I think is something we really should be talking about because to do this, you are being disruptive, disrupt, destructive and throwing things away. I'm choosing not to do the roofs now because there's more life, I'll probably need to ask for more in replacement reserve because normally we would put that in a hard cost number um, at, a, at a 15 year transaction. I don't wanna do that, we have more life here. And then one last thing to, to note when um, Frank mentioned the different carbon sequestration like this timber HP, which is out of Maine um, and uses wood fiber that I believe is from kind of discarded pieces. It's not taking the trees down. Um, and also this opal window system. These are things that um, when we started the process, we knew were coming online, but but Timber HP's factory just got started um, in the fall. I think they're now in September, they're up and running. Um, but we designed our design so it, we could swap it out. We knew that that was there and I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity and as um, our opportunity to apply for HLC funds kind of got pushed out, it actually might be a good thing because now we could align that and same with the windows. So trying to make sure you're designing for the future as you're going um, along. So thank you. Thank you, Frank and Courtney. Uh, we're gonna close out here a little bit. We're okay on time. We got a few more minutes with Ashley. Um, 
Um, and we'll, uh, we may or may not have any time for questions, but we'll be hanging around if people want to talk to us after. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for sticking around with us today. Um, so my name is Ashley Wissey. I'm the Director of Green Building Services at New Ecology, and I was given the Herculean task of explaining how we do projects like the Finch and Treehouse in five to seven minutes. <laughs> five, I got five, okay. Um, most of these projects take us about three to five years. They are not easy or simple by any means. So this is going to be a very high level overview of just some of the things that we try to compare and prioritize when we're working through these pro projects. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for our new construction projects, some of the things that we focus on, again, balancing the want for sustainability with the need to provide affordable housing to our clients. Um, what are the certifications that maybe are required by the funding sources or desired by the developers of the projects? What are the available utility rebates as well as the other money that was discussed previously on the first panel this morning? What are the long-term benefits for the developers and the building occupants? Improving health and indoor environment, improving the energy efficiency, electrifying the systems, and providing future carbon reduction goals are all things that go into how we devise our plan to design, construct, and operate these buildings. With existing buildings, it's a little bit different, but mostly the same. We've still got utility rebates that we're considering. We have savings calculations, usually based on historical data rather than a baseline from a model. Uh, things that we want to focus on for the long-term benefits are refrigerant reduction, so changing over from electrification, but understanding the impacts of the refrigerant on our environment, providing improved indoor environment again, reducing our energy use, and then using strategic improvements to buildings to create a zero over time carbon reduction down to net zero. This is a decarbonization retrofit, a deep energy cost analysis provided by LISC in March, 2023. And I provided this not to scare anyone with a cost per unit. Um, a lot of these cannot be compared apples to apples as we don't have the scope of each of these projects. All of them receive different amounts of upgrades throughout the building. All of them have different number of units, different number of occupants, and are in different locations. But as we discussed as a panel yesterday, one of the big things that's important to everyone here is not sacrificing units in order to get sustainability. So really making sure that we're balancing the sustainable needs as well as the cost to develop these projects. This is an internal uh, map <laughs> that we use to find uh, what code applies to buildings. Uh, it's lovingly referred to as the spaghetti map. Uh, and it's not meant for any of you to be able to read. <laughs> But it is meant to illustrate the uh, mass amount of research and uh, pathways that are available to these buildings, especially in Massachusetts, and especially with the upgrade dates to the stretch code that are coming in the end of this year, as well as up in 2024. Mm -hmm. And then there's also all of the certifications that are available to these projects. So Passive House, LEED, Enterprise Green Communities, general resiliency planning, um, well certification, all of these things that were mentioned in the previous case studies discussed have to be prioritized in different ways depending on, again, funding needs, maybe reduction in um, payments for the future or um, applying for state funding. So one of the key aspects to new ecology's process with the way that we interact with our design teams is em employing more of a circular um, iteration pathway as we go through design. So rather than a linear feedback response, we try to make sure that we're always constantly learning and using a feedback loop to improve these projects. So we start with the geometry, we start with choosing our sustainability pathway. 
We might do some preliminary energy modeling. We get the results of that modeling. We do some calculations with the results and we might change the design because we wanna improve the energy savings there. So then we're gonna do things like value engineering, which also becomes a threat to sustainability at times. Mm -hmm. And then we'll finally have a design submission. We'll get feedback on that design submission if we're submitting for things like passive house or lead. And then we might have to go around the circle again to make some updates depending on what that feedback is. When we move on to construction, we have a similar workflow where we're prioritizing those sustainability requirements. We're training on-site staff. So all of the contractors, the subcontractors, anyone involved in building this building is going to go through numerous training sessions with our staff so that they understand A, the purpose of why we're doing these certifications and also why it's important for them to not put holes in the air barrier, for instance. Uh, we conduct regular inspections throughout the construction process, preliminary testing, and we hope to identify any of those issues as early as possible so that we can fix them when it's still accessible and we're not having to do destructive uh, fixes later in the process. We'll then conduct our final testing, document any lessons learned for future projects because we always hope to return and work with our clients again and then go back and adjust our sustainability goals and requirements as needed for the next project. And then finally, as we move into the occupancy phase of the projects, yet again, we're making sure that the sustainability goals are primary focus. We're gonna train any ongoing um, staff on the site as well as residents of the building. We create a resident green guide for everyone who moves into these buildings so that they understand the certifications that are being put on the building, as well as their responsibility and behavioral patterns that may influence the energy efficiency of that building. We help implement regular equipment maintenance, do things like ongoing commissioning, using building management services, utility data tracking, again, identifying any issues or overages of utility use early, such as the thermostat issue at Finch, and documenting all those lessons learned and applying them to the next project. And that was my very, very brief overview uh, with my contact information, as well as Marty, our director of building carbonization. Big thank you to the panel. Another round of applause for everybody on the panel. Appreciate it. Take a minute here for a couple of questions. Just wanted to add a few points uh, in closing um, from my end. Uh, you know, I'm I'm um, I'm sort of the negotiator uh, on my team, right? So I'm the one who's looking at the documents. Any lenders in the room, for example, I'm the one who's complaining about uh, item 13C on page 26 that I don't like about some covenant. Uh, so I'm always thinking about that uh, as I'm looking through negotiating. And I think the good news from the housing community is we're generally all in support of the sustainability goals. And I think the huge question becomes who pays? Um, and by who pays, uh, I don't think we just mean in terms of uh, ongoing cash flow, uh, uh, Mary was mentioning, or capital, all of that is important. But I think as Ashley just mentioned, part of this is a huge equity question, which is, at least from my vantage point, is we want to make sure as a housing community that we're not making less housing, um, that, that, that the payers are not the families that need the housing units. And specifically, um, from a racial equity question, that they're not uh, specifically households of color, where we end up having less units uh, for people that need them because we're trying to solve other problems. At least in my view, that would not be an acceptable exchange uh, and that's not an equitable response. Uh, and it's certainly one of the fears I have even while we're supportive. So that would be one. The second one I think is what you'll hear a lot of uh, at the moment from the developers and the designers in the room is there is a challenge about the timing of our our cart, our carts and our horses um, and the relationship between uh, what is going to be required, what is required and what built will be required, the technology um, that's there and who's initiating that, who you get as a mechanical engineer, who you end up with an as an architect, who knows what about what you're trying to do, uh, and then who is liable. That relationship is is challenging, um, and there's opportunity there, but certainly would encourage everybody to keep your eyes open as you're thinking about the relationship between those things. We're having requirements 
um, for what we're going to need to do that may be before we know how to do it as well as we'd like um, and be aware, as, especially if you're a developer or an owner, as to what you're liable for and what you what bag you might get um, caught holding. Last one is the question of the utilities um, and DPU, but uh, also the, um, the utilities themselves. Questions around what kind of control they have around our process. I don't know if you've, any of you have ever been jammed up in trying to uh, install um, your solar panels uh, or get your power turned on while you're staring down the barrel of a LIHTC deadline and an equity adjuster. Um, I have more than once. Um, not a great time uh, and not much you can do with the utility uh, because they are not motivated um, by your situation. So that really, we're going to need the utilities to be, I think, a better partner. Um, and uh, the other feature there, uh, as was mentioned before, questions about the reliability and the capacity of the grid. I thought the chief made great commentary and I appreciate how frank she was. We're going to need to, the grid's going to have to be better if we succeed in this. And that's going to have some implications. We're also going to have to navigate how we manage cost, especially at early occupancy. Uh, we took one in the teeth last year where we had something go online. We couldn't get, um, it, as a part of our aggregate, multi-year pricing. We had to pay the floating rate because we didn't have utility data yet. Uh, and we were paying four times per kilowatt hour uh, what we would would have been. We were paying everywhere else in our portfolio, and we had no choice. We had no nothing to negotiate. There was no one to negotiate with. This is why we were experiencing some of the problems Sarah mentioned, uh, which is why are the where, where are the costs? What are the thermostats doing, uh, et cetera? Um, so that made it doubly worse. Anyway, so short version is we want to do it. We need to be able to do it better than we are. And these are some of the people who know how to do that. I think we have just uh, maybe we could take a question or two, Carol, just one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> So I'm going to just repeat that, Courtney. That's okay. So question is, it's a good question. I was wondering the same thing. Is that 230 all in? Question is the $230,000 that was listed for presumably the energy retrofit, how did that relate to the general year 15 uh, rehab and upgrade costs? Um, so I think my compare, it's more right now. Um, then it depends on what you're doing at year 15 and how many year 15s you're in. So I'm working on a, a 346 unit concrete tower in Springfield called Bay State Place. And it's more like $100,000 a unit, but we're not doing a deep energy retrofit. We were just doing plumbing stacks and and, and units, but we've, we've done some other work. We tried to do a deep energy retrofit there and it was going to, uh, this was like five years ago, we were pricing it out and it wasn't feasible. Um, there. So here, some of that 230 is the ADA work. Um, some of it, we did a unit by unit inspection and there are five uh, bathrooms and nine kitchens or maybe vice versa that we're also going to re renovate. So that didn't include, um, that, that's, that number is inclusive of some of that. And then you saw um, Treehouse was listed on Ashley's as a 58,000. So that was kind of an estimate at one point is if we did the same energy retrofit, but maybe not as deep, how much more? So it's not, I don't really have a, a straight answer, but I mean, I, I do think it, at the moment, the cost is, is more than if you were not to decarbonize in in the scope that you put together. Well, Courtney, that's your total, right? I think your question is, is it 230 plus or is it is it 230? That was a hard cost. Yeah. Um, and that okay. was all in. All right, through everything. Great. Take one more, Carol. Yeah, for time. Yes, sir. In the front. Post office evaluations. You mentioned briefly, you know, ongoing commissioning or recommissioning after a year. But um, you know, with these projects, as people have alluded to, there are often unexpected things that happen, and you know, governments love to get you know spend money on stuff. <laughs> but spend money on stuff we can get excited about, but the ongoing realities of these any building is different from what you know the modeling says it's different from what the designers have in mind um because it is real people and real buildings so is there any talk in all of this about funding for ongoing commissioning or retrofit you know um uh, post-occupancy evaluations 
So I can I can say that. Okay. So uh, there are actually I think there are people from Lean here, or maybe Brian left uh, from the Lean Multifamily Energy Program. There are conversations about the sort of thing that you're asking for, and I think it's maybe a years like once you decarbonize or you have a deep energy retrofit, you get like a year worth of maintenance, just checking out for those kind of issues. Put that in the category of ongoing liability, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Who gets caught holding the back? So it's one year, nobody will commit to, this stuff is expensive, but a year before we didn't have even a year. <laughs> yeah, okay. Delighted to have everyone. Thank you for coming. Please feel free to interact. We have a few minutes. Look forward to being a part of this movement with everyone. Take care. Thank you.